My name is uh, Dr. Robert Barron. I'm the Associate Dean for Continuing Medical Education at UCSF and a professor of medicine. I'm also the director of the Osher Mini Medical School uh, program uh, for the public at UCSF uh, and was the founder of the program uh, uh, at, its, uh, at its onset. We put together a really special course uh, this winter quarter uh, that I hope you're enjoying and uh, will continue to enjoy uh, called Optimizing Your Primary Care. Uh, our theme is to focus on uh, a wide variety of the most common issues that come up between patients and their clinicians uh, in the primary care setting uh, so that patients are as well informed as they can possibly be uh, with an eye towards really focusing on what we call shared decision making uh, so that you you can participate in all the difficult decisions we make uh, in a manner that reflects your own values, preferences, uh, and goals. Um, tonight, uh, next week, uh, we're going to talk about immunizations. Uh, later in the course, we'll be talking about high blood cholesterol and heart disease prevention, uh, obesity, and some of the new medications and new diets and intermittent fasting uh, and the like, uh, and then end with issues around diabetes, uh, particularly uh, including prediabetes, uh, and especially in new treatment uh, methods and the use of some very exciting uh, newer medications. Tonight, though, we're going to talk about what's really one of the most common issues, common conversations in primary care, uh, because it occurs almost every year, uh, especially for those over age 45, uh, with some relevance for those who are younger as well, um, and that is the pre prevention of common cancers. Our speaker is Dr. Judith Walsh, uh, who's the professor of medicine and associate medical director of our outstanding women's health uh, program at UCSF. Judith uh, not only is an outstanding clinician and teacher, but she's been a, an amazing advocate for cancer screening and prevention, as well as a scholar uh, working with the American Cancer Society and, and many other local and national groups uh, on innovative methods for cancer uh, screening and prevention. Uh, she's spoken on this topic often. Uh, it's easy to invite Judith to do this, and you'll see why as we get started. Uh, but in addition, it's a topic that's always changing. There's always something new. There's always new controversies, uh, and Judith is uh, the best person uh, to really address them. Uh, so we've asked her to speak about this. We've entitled it Prevention and Early Detection of Common Cancers. Uh, we'll talk about cervical cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, um, uh, uh, prostate cancer and lung cancer. Judith, thank you very much for doing this. So as Bobby said, we have a lot of ground to cover, uh, prevention and early detection of many common cancers. So things we will talk about this evening are, what can we do to prevent cancer? What can we do to find cancer early? What are factors that increase a person's risk of getting a particular disease or cancer? And what are factors that decrease a person's chance of getting a disease or cancer? So when we talk about prevention, there are three categories of prevention that we think about. So the first one is called primary prevention, and that means preventing the disease before it even occurs. So for example, if you quit smoking and you prevent getting lung cancer in the first place. Secondary prevention is early detection of disease. So for example, if a woman has a mammogram, that finds an abnormality that happens sooner than she would have felt an abnormality in her breast, then that leads to earlier detection and typically better outcomes. And then tertiary prevention is preventing complications of established disease. So we're gonna focus mostly this evening on primary prevention and secondary prevention. And then I also wanna just talk a little bit before we move into the specific cancer about risk factors. So we all hear about this is a risk for that, that's a risk for this. So risk factors increase the chance of a person getting a particular cancer. They don't guarantee that the person will get the cancer. An absence of the risk factor doesn't mean the person won't get the cancer, but it does increase the risk of getting a particular cancer. So for example, um, smoking increases the chance of getting lung disease, lung cancer, and high blood pressure increases the chance of getting heart disease. Protective factors are those things that decrease the chance of getting a particular cancer. So we'll talk about this later, but for example, oral contraceptives can decrease the chance of developing ovarian cancer. 
Now, some risk factors that we think about are not modifiable. We can't do anything about them. So the biggest risk factor for most cancers that we will talk about this evening is just getting older. And that unfortunately is a risk factor that none of us can do anything about. Similarly, having a family history of a particular cancer is also not something that we can change. But some risk factors can be changed. So example, smoking, diet, and exercise are things that we can change to impact our risk of getting a disease. So when we talk about screening, we're thinking about secondary prevention. And many of many people, when we go to our primary care doctors, we talk with our doctor about what are the screening tests that I should get? What kind of cancer screening test should I get? So just to remind us in general of the definition of screening, screening in general means investigating a large number of something, such as people, to look for those with a particular problem or feature. In medicine, it's a strategy that we use in a population to detect a disease in people who don't have features of that disease. So for example, if a woman comes into her doctor with no symptoms and is 50 years old, the doctor will order a screening mammogram. If the woman comes into her doctor and says, I feel something in my breast, I feel an abnormality, I feel a lump. So that's not screening, that's evaluation or diagnostic mammogram. And so just when we think about screening in general, we're thinking about people who have no symptoms and whether or not we should be doing all these tests and whether or not they will have a positive outcome. So things we think about when we think about screening. First of all, the disease needs to be common. If you're gonna test a lot of people looking for a disease who don't have any symptoms, the disease needs to be common enough that it makes sense to do that. When we talk about ovarian cancer later, that's one of the major challenges with screening for ovarian cancer is that thankfully it's a very rare cancer. So the vast majority of abnormal tests turn out to be false positives. Secondly, we wanna screen for something that has serious consequences. So we don't screen for the common cold because by the time we found it, the person would be getting better anyway and there's nothing necessarily to do. This will come up a little bit when we talk about prostate cancer because although there are some situations where prostate cancer can lead to significant consequences, there are many situations in which prostate cancer is a man has it, may have it found on autopsy, but it didn't really cause him any serious consequences during his lifetime. Very importantly, is there what we call a detectable preclinical phase? That means a time before the person has symptoms. So breast cancer screening, for example, with mammography, we can detect abnormalities on the mammogram before the woman feels a lump in her breast. Hand in hand with that, we wanna know that treating that presymptomatic disease is more effective than waiting till after symptoms develop. So if it's gonna be the same difference to find it early on a mammogram versus wait for the woman to come in with a breast mass, if the outcomes are gonna be the same, then one could argue why go searching for it early. But if, if we're gonna be able to treat it earlier and have a better outcome, then that's what we wanna be able to do. And ideally we want tests that are simple, inexpensive and acceptable with a high sensitivity and specificity. And that means ability to find disease in people who have it and ability in people who don't have it for them to not test positive for the disease. So very, very importantly, when we think about a cancer screening test, when we think about effectiveness, we really need to have evidence that early detection reduces the chance of dying from that cancer. Not just that early detection finds more stuff. You'll see in some of the tests that we talk about, and you can imagine if you give you know, a bunch of people a real reasonably good test, and a lot of other people don't get the test, you're gonna find more cancer in the people who get the test. But we really wanna know, does finding that more cancer lead to a better outcome? Does it lead to the person having a lower chance of dying from that cancer? Ideally, we wanna have very few false positives because what that means, if I, for example, go and have a mammogram and an abnormality is found on a mammogram that then leads me to have additional testing such as a diagnostic mammogram and an ultrasound and maybe even a biopsy, ultimately to find out I didn't have cancer, that's a lot to be happening, a lot of additional testing for that false positive test result. 
And then we also want to ask, where does the evidence about effectiveness come from? And this will be particularly relevant when we talk about primary prevention. So in the ideal world, we like to do what we call randomized controlled trials, which means we have a group of people, half of them get uh, the screening test, the other half don't. We follow them forward for X number of years and look at their chance of dying from the disease. When we look at things like diet and exercise, it's really difficult. You can't really randomize people to a particular diet versus another that they're gonna eat for 10 years and be followed forward. We also can get information from what we call case control studies and also from cohort studies. But we'll talk a little bit about some of the cancer screening evidence and the, the one, the typical evidence that is best comes from randomized controlled trials. So what are some other considerations? And so when, in what case should we be screening everybody? So for example, as Bobby alluded to earlier, people of a certain age, we recommend screening for a variety of different things. In what case should we be doing universal screening versus in what cases should we be doing more selective screening for focusing on those who are at higher risk? So for example, when we talk about lung cancer screening, it's not just recommended for everybody, it's recommended for those who are at particular risk for lung cancer based on their smoking history. And we talked a little bit about rare diseases and false positive test results. Bobby alluded to earlier about shared decision-making when particularly in the situations where the recommendations are less clear, how do I decide what, I, what kind of test I wanna have? When I'm a physician talking to a patient, how do we decide together whether or not the patient wants to have this test? What is the value of this test? In many situations, what other medical conditions does the patient have? So for example, if a patient has multiple other severe medical conditions, maybe they wouldn't want to be or able to be a candidate for having breast cancer surgery if an abnormality was found. What's the associated life expectancy this person has without screening? How feasible would it be to be treated? And what effects would these treatment have on quality of life? So we'll talk, as we alluded to earlier, about several different topics, breast cancer, colorectal cancer, lung cancer. We will focus, and I'll tell you a little bit about the recommendations of a group called the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. I'll also, for breast cancer, tell you about the recommendations from the American Cancer Society, because many women are hearing about those, and they're somewhat similar, but not exactly the same. And we'll talk specifically about prevention. Colorectal cancer, the issue is what test and how often, as there are a lot of different tests. Again, the Preventive Services Task Force recommendations. And lung cancer, who should we screen and how can we prevent lung cancer? Prostate cancer, the question is really, should we screen at all and how can we prevent it? Cervical cancer, we'll talk about screening recommendations and also the HPV vaccine, which has significantly had an impact on cervical cancer. And then for ovarian cancer, again, the question, should we screen and what can we do to prevent ovarian cancer? So the US Preventive Services Task Force is a multidisciplinary group in contrast to many of the organizations who make recommendations on screening. For example, the American Gastrointestinal Society makes recommendations on colon cancer screening. So they have a particular perspective, but the US Preventive Services Task Force is really composed of people from multiple different disciplines from specialties, from primary care, from health services coming together to rigorously review what evidence we have for screening. And they give ratings that reflect the strength of the evidence, looking at the benefits and potential harms of preventive service. And I think it's very important for us to continue to remember that all of these tests that we're thinking about do have potential harms. And it's, we, we just want to think carefully about doing any of these tests and not to just assume that all screening tests are good. Very importantly, too, the task force does not consider the cost of the service or make any recommendations about whether or not insurance should cover it. So the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force use different grades of evidence. So anything that is rated a grade A, they say that there's a high certainty of a substantial net benefit, and they recommend that we provide this service. Something that is a grade B is a high certainty of a moderate net benefit or a moderate certainty of a moderate substantial net benefit. So not quite as strong evidence, but still recommended that we provide it. Grade C, moderate certainty that the net benefit is small and maybe we can think about selectively offering that. 
grade D, there is no net benefit or the harms are greater than the benefits. And they recommend that we do not provide that service. And then quite frequently, they'll give a, a recommendation of a grade I, insufficient evidence regarding the balance of the benefits and harms. So let's start with breast cancer screening. So breast cancer, as we know, is the most common cancer in women and the second leading cause of cancer death in women. We do know that screening mammography reduces the risk of dying from breast cancer. As I mentioned earlier, the biggest risk factor for almost all of the cancers we're talking about tonight, with the exception of cervical cancer, is getting older. So a lot of the debate or discussion around screening younger women has to do with the fact that younger women have a lower risk of breast cancer to start with. And they also have denser breast tissue and the way we see an abnormality on a mammogram is as a density. So it's harder to see density within density. So as I mentioned, there's harms with every screening test that we do. So one of the main harms of mammography is false positives. And I would say that probably most primary care physicians have at least one conversation a week with a patient about an abnormal mammogram, which is going to require additional testing, perhaps a diagnostic mammogram, perhaps an ultrasound, uh, perhaps a biopsy. There's lots of anxiety, um, potential additional tests with biopsies, and then additional cost. And again, this is in people who ultimately don't turn out to have cancer anyway. There's also concern about overdiagnosis, which is finding cancers that wouldn't have necessarily, they were early phase cancers that wouldn't have necessarily caused a problem to the woman. And then of course, with any radi radiological procedure that we do, there is some risk of radiation exposure, although it's very, very low with mammography. So I wanna talk a little bit about clinical uh, breast exams and self breast exams. So clinical breast exam is the exam that a provider would do when a patient comes in to the office to be seen. A uh, self breast exam, of course, is, is an exam that women would do at home and that we would teach them how to do at home. So clinical breast exam isn't as good as mammography. The other piece is that typical studies that have studied um, clinical breast exam have been studied in combination with mammography. And so it's been really hard to separate how much of an impact clinical breast exam might have. There seems to be a slight increase in detection rate, but a lot of more false positives. Now, breast self-exam was something that we taught women how to do for years. We had women hang little placards in the, in the shower with the best ways to do this. And there was actually a very large study done in China where a large number of women in a certain group of factories were taught how to do breast self-exam. Women in the other group of factories were taught um, things to do to prevent back pain based on the um, work, workplace um, incidence of back pain. And they found that the women who did breast self-exam found a lot more stuff but it was more benign lesions, um, things that didn't turn out to be cancer, and there was no reduction in the chance of dying from breast cancer. So what does the US Preventive Services Task Force say that we should do for mammography? So for women age 50 to 74, they recommend a screening mammogram every two years. There has been a lot of discussion in the past about every one year versus every two years, but when you look at the benefits of screening every year versus every two years, they are the same. And so the recommendation from the US Preventive Services Task Force is every two years. For women in their 40s, age 40 to 49, they don't recommend that we absolutely screen or that we absolutely don't screen, but that we have a discussion, that we have an individualized decision about screening every two years. And so we should talk to the woman about the pros and cons, about her particular risk, and decide with her whether or not she wants to be screened. For age 75 and over, they give a, um, a grade I recommendation, insufficient evidence to recommend for or against. Um, breast exam, which we just talked about, so clinical breast exam alone, grade I, insufficient evidence. And they recommend against teaching women how to do routine breast self-exam because there's no mortality benefit and there were more benign breast biopsies. Many of you may be familiar with a mammographic technique, which is increasingly commonly done, which is digital breast tomosynthesis, which looked, is the mammogram in multiple dimensions. The US Preventive Services Task Force gives this a grade I, insufficient evidence, to assess the balance of benefits and harms. 
And they also importantly give a grade I recommendation to the um, assessing the risks and benefits of adjunct screening for women with dense breast and another otherwise normal mammogram. So as many of you know, in many states, when a woman has dense breasts noted on mammogram, it's required that she be told that she has dense breast. Dense breasts in and of themselves are associated with a slight increased risk of breast cancer. But the, And then they encourage the woman to talk to your doctor about what you should do about this. The challenge is, is that there's nothing that we know that we can do about these dense breasts. It's not something women can potentially change. And there's no evidence that doing extra things in a woman with no symptoms, so for example, ultrasound, MRI, or other testing, changes the outcomes. The U.S. Preventive Services Task Force last updated this topic a few years ago. They are in the process of updating the topic again, and so there could be some changes in the next year or so. The American Cancer Society recommends beginning mammography at age 45, and that women age 45 to 54 should be screened every year. They used to recommend that we, that we start screening at the age of 40. Now they still say that women age 40 to 44 should have the opportunity to be screened if they want to. Women age 55 and older should be screened every two years or can do annually if they want to. And continue screening as long as overall health is good and the person has at least a 10 year life expectancy. This will be a, an important theme with all the screening that we think about because we're looking for something that ultimately could become an issue several years down the road and whether or not the woman has an adequate life expectancy to benefit from finding an early cancer is very important. And they also don't recommend routine clinical breast exam for women at any age. Women at high risk, and again, this is a very small subset of women. This is women who have a lifetime risk of 20 to 25% or greater of getting breast cancer. These are often women with a BRCA1 or BRCA mutation or who have a first degree relative with that mutation or have certain high risk breast cancer syndromes. It's a very small subset of people for whom MRI and mammogram are recommended every year. The potential benefit of MRI is that it's not affected by breast density. And so there's the ability to see more stuff. But of course, when you see more stuff, then you have to go figure out what that is with additional testing. And very importantly, women with a lifetime risk of breast cancer of less than 15% should not get MRI screening. So again, this is a very small select group. So what can we do for primary prevention of breast cancer? Again, reminding ourselves primary prevention is what can I do to reduce the chance of getting breast cancer in the first place? The mammogram is gonna find it early, but what can I do to reduce the chance of getting it in the first place? So first of all, limiting alcohol intake, maintaining ideal body weight, being physically active, breastfeeding, and avoiding postmenopausal hormone therapy, which with longer duration of use has been shown to increase the risk of breast cancer. So there's another category of primary prevention, which is called chemo prevention, which is a medication that one can take to reduce risk of disease. So as we said, screening detects it early, doesn't prevent it. For women at high risk, other preventive strategies should be considered. And there are two groups of medications, the selective estrogen receptor modulators, such as tamoxifen or raloxifene, and the aromatase inhibitors, they've both been shown to decrease risk of breast cancer. So the, again, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, they recommend that clinicians and patients have a shared decision-making conversation about medications to reduce their risk. This is really for women at a particular high risk of breast cancer, not for average risk women, but for women at high risk for breast cancer, and at low risk for some of the adverse medication effects, which most commonly include an increased risk of blood clots, they recommend that we have that conversation. And women who have a five-year breast cancer risk of greater than or equal to 3% are more likely to benefit. And again, they don't recommend that it be routinely used for women who are not at increased risk. But this is, again, for a select group of high-risk people, a way that a medication can reduce the chance of getting cancer. How do we assess the risk? The um, National Cancer Institute has a breast cancer risk calculator. The, the mutations we talked about, um, anybody who's had chest radiation therapy. And then of course, we wanna reassess the risk if there's any significant change in breast cancer risk factors. So let's turn now to lung cancer screening and prevention. 
Some of you may be familiar with Virginia Slims. This was a way of marketing cigarettes to women to show that women could smoke too. And uh, it was a very glamorous woman who was continuing to smoke. You may have seen this on the bus stations. I've seen this in my shopping cart at my local Safeway, which is a sign in the shopping, in the shopping cart. If you smoked, this lung cancer screening could save your life. Saved by the scan.org. So I'm gonna have you pretend that you are a primary care physician seeing this patient. Ms. Virginia Slim is a 69 year old woman with a 50 pack year history of smoking and COPD. COPD is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, chronic bronchitis and emphysema, which is caused by significant lung damage, um, primarily often due to smoking. You've previously been unsuccessful in encouraging her to quit smoking. She comes in after her visit to the grocery store, reading her sign in the grocery cart, and wants to know whether or not you think she should have a lung cancer screening test. What do you recommend? Yes, absolutely. I will only order it if you quit smoking. No, you already have COPD, so it's too late for you to benefit. Or let's talk about the pros and cons. So we're going to talk about the details shortly, but it's it's the current recommendation is that we talk about the pros and cons with patients instead of just ordering it. So yes, absolutely would not be correct. I will only order it if you quit smoking. There has been a lot of discussion about trying to couple lung cancer screening with encouraging people to quit smoking because we know that that's the best way to reduce lung cancer risk. No, you already have COPD and so it's too late for you to benefit. So we probably wouldn't quite say it this in this way, but it is depending on the severity of the person's lung disease. For example, if she was on home oxygen or had severe disease, might not tolerate surgery, it may not make sense to screen for lung cancer. And so thinking about the person's other medical conditions and whether or not it would make sense to screen, whether or not they would be a surgical candidate, et cetera. And then finally, let's talk about the pros and cons. So the test that we do is called low-dose spiral computed tomography. It's a special kind of low-dose CAT scan. It can scan the lung in less than 20 seconds, which is a single breath hold. It doesn't require any intravenous contrast. The radiation is more than a regular chest X-ray, but less than a regular CT scan. And the potential advantage, it can detect many smaller things than a regular chest X-ray. So this is the big study that really changed our thinking about lung cancer screening. This was called the National Lung Screening Trial where they randomized over 50,000 participants to either get an annual chest X-ray or an annual CT. Very importantly, all of the people in this study had a 30 or more pack year history of smoking, which means a pack a day for 30 years. They were all age 50 to 74. They got annual CTs for three years and were followed for six and a half years. So the big question we ask ourselves is, did it reduce lung cancer mortality? So you can see 356 deaths in the low-dose CT group, 443 in the chest X-ray group. The relative risk, which is comparing the two groups, is 0.8. This is what we call the confidence interval, and this does not include one. So this means there was a 20% chance, 20% reduction in dying from lung cancer. Very, very importantly, when you look at any death, um, 1,877 with low-dose CT, 2,000 with chest X-ray relative risk of 0.93, so a 7% reduction in death of any cause. This is the first cancer screening study that has ever shown this. So this was huge news. However, to achieve this mortality reduction, there were 75,000 CT scans, over 18,000 positive tests. Of them, over 17,000 were false positive tests. And as we talked about before, false positive tests lead to additional other testing. Many of the other things that happened with additional testing were additional CT scans with a shorter follow-up, but some of them were bigger deals. So for example, 673 had thoracotomy, which is cutting open the, the chest or the thorax to look inside, uh, or a mediastinoscopy, which is a special test looking at the mediastinum in the chest, which is kind of a big deal. 303 had bronchoscopies, which is a tube going down um, into the lungs to look for abnormalities. 99 had biopsies, all to prevent 62 deaths from lung cancer. 
So certainly reduce mortality, but lots and lots of false positives and additional testing. So if you look at how did CT help compared to chest X-ray, so basically chest X-ray doesn't work. So uh, 13, uh, so four in a thousand fewer died from lung cancer, 13 versus 17. Five in a thousand fewer died from all causes, 70 versus 75. But again, looking at what problems did the CT scans have compared with chest X-ray, 223 in 1,000 had at least one false alarm, 18 in 1,000 had at least had a false alarm leading to an invasive procedure, and two in 1,000 had a major complication from the invasive procedure. So again, lots of significant reduction in death from lung cancer and from all causes, but um, additional problems and additional testing. So the harms, as we mentioned, false positives, um, at least one false positive test in 39%. Um, there was concern for possible overdiagnosis. Again, the more you look, the more you find. So they initially found a higher cancer incidence. Uh, we talked a little bit of, uh, about radiation exposure. And although this is less than a conventional CT, it does have to be done annually. And we like to be um, cognizant of how often we're exposing patients to radiation. And then, of course, there's always the concern for what we call incidental findings, which is we're doing a, a CT scan to look specifically for lung cancers or early lung cancers, but the radiologist is going to look at everything that they see, and they might find some additional things that need additional testing. So more recently, there was a study done in Europe, and they looked at screening a little bit less often. So the, the National Lung Screening Study we talked about was every year. This was every two years. Very importantly, they included people who hadn't smoked quite as much as in the prior study. And they had sort of fine-tuned the program for how to manage abnormal nodules that we're seeing on the CT scan. So this led to a little bit less overdiagnosis and fewer false positives. So coming back to the US Preventive Services Task Force, uh, after this, the initial study was published, it took some time to figure out exactly what their recommendation was gonna be. Again, great mortality reduction, but lots of false positives. So they recommend annual screening for lung cancer with low dose CT in individuals at high risk for lung cancer based on age and smoking history. So in contrast to mammography, which was only age-based screening, this is people based on age and their smoking history. They initially published recommendations in 2013 and then they updated them in 2021. So the current age now is 50 to 80. So anybody 50 to 80 um, with this particular smoking history should be considered for screening. Total exposure to tobacco smoke is 20 pack years or more. The initial recommendations were 30 pack years or more, but based on the more recent study, we've seen that even those with a little bit less of a smoking history can still benefit. And then they either want to screen current smokers or those who have quit within the last 15 years. And so for example, if I quit smoking 20 years ago, then I wouldn't be eligible for screening. But if I quit smoking 14 years ago, then I would be eligible. And then they remind us, as we talked about earlier, to consider the person's other comorbidities. What other illnesses does he or she have to determine whether or not they'll benefit from screening? The screening should be discontinued once a person has not smoked for 15 years, or develops a health problem that substantially limits life expectancy or the ability or willingness to have curative surgery. We talked about the shared decision making for this and you know, not just absolutely ordering it, but very importantly, um, there, there has to be a written order for lung cancer screening during a visit where we have evidence that we have talked about the pros and cons with our patient. So in contrast to just ordering a mammogram, which I can order without discussing the pros and cons in, a, in the appropriate patient. I need to have it document that I've had a discussion about the pros and cons of lung cancer screening. So what are some of the things that should occur in that shared decision-making conversation? Lung cancer screening does reduce mortality. There are benefits and harms. There will be potentially follow-up diagnostic testing, overdiagnosis, false positives, and there is a risk of radiation exposure. If, I, if the patient chooses to get screened, it's recommended that it be done annually. Again, coming back to the impact of comorbidities, other illnesses or medical conditions that the patient has, 
Would this person be able and or willing to undergo diagnosis and treatment? And of course, reminding them of the importance of tobacco abstinence and giving information about how to quit smoking. There are some good tools for patients and clinicians. There's a patient decision aid called Is Lung Cancer Screening Right For Me? put out by the AHRQ. And we know how to prevent lung cancer. Screening has been a big step and it really helps us to define the cancers earlier, but we know how we can prevent lung cancer. So what are the implications? So certainly everybody should be encouraged to quit smoking. And then when we do screen, we wanna be sure that we strictly adhere to the guidelines and that we consider screening in those age 50 to 80 who have 20 or more pack years history of smoking. So let's turn now to colorectal cancer. So what is the goal of screening for colorectal cancer? Ideally, we wanna be able to detect and remove early cancers. So if we find an early cancer to remove it, we also wanna be able to detect and remove early lesions, which are called adenomas, they're growths inside the colon, which if left in place could progress to cancer over time, over many years, but if removed, then of course can't, prevent, can't progress to cancer. There are lots of guidelines about colon cancer screening, but again, we're gonna focus on the US Preventive Services Task Force guidelines. So their most recent set of guidelines recommend screening for colorectal cancer in all adults age 50 to 75. They give this a grade A recommendation, which you'll recall was the highest grade of the task force. This, new, this most recent recommendation is now including screening for colorectal cancer in all adults age 45 to 49. And when Bobby was talking about what we would be speaking about this evening, he alluded to you know, a 45 year old individual visiting their doctor and talking about screening. So this is a new recommendation to start at the age of 45. The strength of the evidence isn't quite as good. They give it a grade A, a pardon me, a grade B recommendation. And then selectively offer screening to adults age 76 to 85. This is a grade C recommendation. Again, thinking about what is the person's 10 year life expectancy, what other diseases does he or she have? Would he or she want to undergo surgery, et cetera? So what's, this is the new piece about the age 45 to 49. So age 50 to 74 has been recommended for years, but recommending screening in individuals age 40 to 49, 45 to 49 is new. So the evidence is adequate as opposed to convincing in the older age group for accurate detection of early stage colorectal cancer and adenomatous polyps. The screening accuracy appears to be comparable. There's adequate evidence as opposed to convincing evidence that screening is of moderate benefit in reducing mortality. And modeling analysis do suggest a reduction in death and life years gained if we start screening at age 45. So if you look at certainty and benefit for age 45 to 49, there's a moderate certainty of a moderate net benefit. Age 50 to 75, there's a high certainty of a substantial net benefit. And age 76 to 85, there's a moderate certainty of a small net benefit, particularly in those who have not been previously screened. So there's a lot less to be gained in individuals who have been previously screened, but individuals age 76 to 85 who have not had previous screening potentially have more to gain. The big issue that comes up all the time with colorectal cancer screening is which test should I have and which test is a better test. So as I think you probably know, there are many different screening strategies available and we'll talk about them. They differ in terms of how often they need to be done, where the screening takes place, does it happen at home or does one have to go into a hospital or an outpatient setting? Is there a need for preparation or an anesthesia? And at this point, there is no evidence that any strategy provides a greater net benefit. So what are the options? So FIT or fecal immunochemical test or high sensitivity uh, GFOBT, which is fecal occult blood test every year. So that's a stool test that a person can do at home every year. So that's one option. A DNA, a stool DNA combined with FIT every three years. So that's a combined test. We'll talk a little bit about the fecal DNA test. CT colonography or virtual colonoscopy every five years. Flexible sigmoidoscopy every five years flexible sigmoidoscopy every 10 years, plus FIT every year, or colonoscopy every 10 years. So these are a lot of choices. So FIT is probably the most commonly used stool test when, when an individual gets tested with a stool test for colorectal cancer screening. 
Um, it's the fecal immunochemical test. It uses antibodies that will um, attach to any part of human blood that is found in the stool. That person doesn't have to alter their diet before they do it. It's more sensitive in finding big adenomas than FOBT, and it's a little less specific than FOBT. Other tests, you've probably heard of virtual colonoscopy, stool-based molecular testing or fecal DNA, combined FIT and stool DNA, and something called septin-9, which is a blood test, which is not currently recommended. So let's talk about CT colonography or virtual colonoscopy. So this is a non-invasive radiological technique and the radiation dose is similar to barium enema. Now, oftentimes when a person doesn't wanna have a colonoscopy, he or she says, well, I don't wanna have a colonoscopy because I don't wanna do the prep. Well, so I'd rather have a virtual colonoscopy. Well, right now, virtual colonoscopy also requires a prep, although there are some studies underway looking at prepless techniques. It doesn't require sedation. The colon gets distended with carbon dioxide or air. Individual has to hold their breath for 20 to 50 seconds. But very importantly, if polyps are found, then the person still has to have a colonoscopy to remove those polyps. So people often wanna have a virtual colonoscopy to avoid having a colonoscopy. But again, after the virtual colonoscopy, if there are polyps found, then the colonoscopy needs, still needs to happen. Potential harms, again, radiation, procedure-related harms, although it's very low, and then extracolonic findings. So again, you're doing this virtual colonoscopy just to look at the colon, but the radiologist sees everything else that's in the abdomen and has to comment on everything that he or she sees. So findings outside the colon are very, very common. Those that are of high clinical significance require either surgical or medical treatment or intervention or further investigation. And that's a much smaller percentage, but somewhere between about seven to 16% of individuals need some kind of additional valuation, maybe an ultrasound, maybe a repeat CT, something like that for extra colonic findings. Very few of these abnormalities ultimately require definitive treatment. Fecal DNA testing is a PCR test for DNA mutations in the stool. The potential advantages is that it's non-invasive. There there's no advanced preparation and it does allow for detection along the entire length of the colon. Uh, the multi-target stool DNA testing, they did a big study giving um, having the multi-target DNA test fit and colonoscopy to almost 10,000 average risks individuals in multiple different centers. They found that the fecal DNA found more neoplasms or cancers than fit, but there were also a lot more false positives, and of course, false positives we know lead to additional testing. There also seem to be a lot more problems with sample collection or assay application greater than with the DNA test. Combined FIT and stool DNA, you've probably seen ads on TV for Cologuard, which is the only combined stool DNA with FIT available in the United States. It of course hasn't been uh, evaluated for whether or not it can show a decrease in mortality. However, its sensitivity for finding colorectal cancer is 92%. So that means amongst people who had colorectal cancer, 92% of them were detected with, uh, with the Cologuard test and specificity 84%. So 84% of people who didn't have cancer tested negative with this test. The US Preventive Services Task Force does offer it as an option for screening. And if it is used as an option, it's recommended that it be done every three years. So colorectal cancer screening, one of the biggest challenges is, has to do with the fact that there are so many choices. And this was a trial where they offered colonoscopy, FOBT, or a choice of which one do you want to have? Do you want a colonoscopy or a stool test? And they had about 1,000 individuals followed for 12 months. And they found that if, the, if colonoscopy was the only thing recommended, that the adherence was a lot lower. So people who were given the stool test, 67%. People who were told to have a colonoscopy, 38%, and people who were given a choice, um, the adherence was a little bit higher. So, particularly in settings such as San Francisco, where we have a lot of colonoscopy availability, I think it is important for us to have the conversation with the with the patient about which test he or she would like to have, rather than to automatically recommend a colonoscopy. In resource poor settings, where there are fewer colonoscopy um, 
less colonoscopy availability off more commonly. Everybody starts with a stool test, but I think it's just important to recognize that there are a variety of tests available. And if you look at sort of trends over time, you can see we're making progress in colorectal cancer screening. But even you know getting up to 68% is great, but with, with mammography and pap smears, we tend to be more at the 80 to 85% level. So we need to continue to increase to ensure that all who should be screened are screened for colorectal cancer. So in conclusion, our job as physicians and providers is to offer testing and to remind ourselves that any screening is better than no screening for reducing colorectal cancer mortality. And I think quite often there gets to be a big debate about which test is best. And if neither test gets done, then it's not the, the best test. And so any screening is better than no screening. And we know, nearly need to focus on increasing the awareness of the importance of colorectal cancer screening. The importance of patient preferences. Again, the best test is the test that the test that gets done. And again, all tests lead to all roads do lead to colonoscopy. So any test that is abnormal. So for example, if the stool test shows evidence of blood, if the virtual colonoscopy shows a polyp, then anything that is abnormal on a non-colonoscopy test does have to be evaluated with diagnostic colonoscopy. So for example, if a patient says to me, I want to do the stool test because there's absolutely no way I would ever have a colonoscopy, I need to talk to them about, well, if the stool test is positive, would you have a colonoscopy? Because if the answer is no, then we probably shouldn't even do the test. But just to remind ourselves that all roads do lead to colonoscopy. So all roads lead to Rome or colonoscopy. So in terms of prevention, again, the evidence is, is not as um, clear for any of the primary prevention strategies just because we can't do the same type of trials. But we do know that alcohol intake, smoking, and obesity increase the risk of colorectal cancer, and that physical activity, aspirin, and combined hormone therapy, and removal of polyps reduce the risk of colorectal cancer. Now, for example, there has been, there have been several studies showing that aspirin reduces is associated with a reduced risk of colorectal cancer. That being said, it is not recommended to take aspirin primarily to reduce the risk of colorectal cancer. So if one is taking aspirin for another reason, then one can be reassured that it might potentially be decreasing the risk. And similarly with combined hormone therapy, that's the topic we're not addressing in this particular series, I don't think, Bobby, but the whole pros and cons of hormone therapy is a whole nother discussion. But again, should a woman be taking hormone therapy, it will be associated with a reduction in colorectal cancer risk, but not a reason, primary reason to take hormone therapy. So let's turn now to cervical cancer screening and prevention. So cervical cancer, as I'm, I'm sure everybody knows, the cervix is a part of the uterus in women, the part that protrudes into the um, vaginal area. And the pap smear was developed many, many years ago, which has really been associated with a dramatic reduction in mortality with routine screening. So women undergoing pap smears or um, tests for cervical cytology has been associated with a, a huge reduction in cervical cancer mortality. We've also learned that a virus called human, human papillomavirus is the causative agent in the majority of cases of cervical cancer. This is a virus that's associated with being sexually active and the vast majority of cases of cervical cancer and or cervical abnormalities are associated with HPV. It really takes a long time for cervical cancer to develop what we call a long latency period. So for example, for an initial abnormality seen on cervical cytology or pap smear to ultimately become cancer can take up to about 10 years. And so it takes a very long time. So we have multiple opportunities to find abnormalities that we can do something about in the interim. Another very important piece when we think about cervical cancer screening is that a lot of the initial abnormalities that we've seen, some of the initial HPV abnormalities are going to get better on their own anyway. And so there has been a lot of discussion about how hard we should be looking for things that are gonna be getting better on their own. So the screening tests that we have, first of all, cervical cytology or the Papa Nicolau or pap smear is what has typically been called. Um, HPV, human papillomavirus testing for high risk strains, and then a combination of the two, combined cytology and HPV testing. And this is referred to as co-testing. 
So the US Preventive Services Task Force has given us screening guidelines. So this is the one cancer amongst all the ones we're talking about tonight where um, age is not the biggest risk factor for getting this. This tends to be more common in younger age groups and the risk significantly decreases as individuals get older in contrast to all the other cancers we're talking about. So screening should start in women at the age of 21 and women age 21 to 29 should have cytology alone every three years. What we know about women in this age group is that there is a lot of exposure to HPV, but there's also a very high rate of the HPV being cleared on its own in this age group. So we don't really wanna go searching for it. So cytology alone every three years is recommended in this age group. For women age 30 to 65, there are a few options. We can do cytology alone every three years. High risk HPV testing alone can be done every five years. The caveat for this being is that there are only a couple of HPV tests that are FDA approved for primary testing, and those aren't in um, as common use currently. So if, if that's gonna be done, it has to be with those particular tests. And then the final option is co-testing. So the cytology and the HPV alone every five years. Who should we not screen? We do not need to screen women younger than 21. We do not need to screen women who have had a hysterectomy, which is removal of the uterus, including removal of the cervix. So they don't have a cervix to be screened as long as they don't have a history of cervical cancer or CIN two or three, which are two of the precursors to cervical cancer. So they're not quite cancer, but they're along that spectrum. Women age 65 and older who have been adequately screened and are not otherwise at high risk can actually stop screening. So in contrast to all the other cancers we're thinking about where we're trying to decide about screening at older ages, um, in women age 65 and over, it can just stop. So what about primary prevention? What can we do to prevent cervical cancer from happening in the first place? So behavioral factors, so postponing sexual debut, limiting the number of sexual partners, and using barrier contraception. These are all behavioral factors that can reduce the risk of developing cervical cancer. The other very, very important mechanism for primary prevention is the HPV vaccine. So this is the human papillomavirus vaccine. It's given in two to three doses, depending on the age at which it was started. And currently the nine valent vaccine, which is against nine of the different HPV strains is the one available in the United States. So HPV vaccination is recommended at age 11 or 12. And then for anybody up to the age of 26 who has not been previously vaccinated, um, he or she should get vaccinated to complete the series. There's been a lot of discussion about what to do for men and women over age 26. So adults age 26 to 45 who want to have the HPV vaccine should have a shared decision-making discussion with their clinicians. The vast majority of adults at this age will not need it. And it's, it's significantly left less efficacious because many people by this age or most people by this age have already been exposed to the HPV strains that are causative. And so the vaccine is much less likely to have an impact. However, regardless of vaccination status, whether or not one is vaccinated or not, the screening recommendations with cytology and or HPV testing remain the same. Let's turn now to prostate cancer screening and prevention. And the, really the question for prostate cancer is, should we screen? So prostate cancer, of course, is an issue for men. The prostate is a gland um, located near the, uh, the, the urethra and the penis. And the disease of prostate cancer is very, very common. About 10% of men will develop prostate cancer at some point. Importantly, about 30% of men will have prostate cancer found at autopsy, which may or may not have caused any problems. And so even though 10% of men will, will have prostate cancer, it may not be a significant disease for many of these men. The disease has serious consequences sometimes, but it may be a benign disease for many men. So unfortunately, for some men, it can be an aggressive disease and can metastasize to the bones and cause a variety of different problems. But for many men, it can be a much more indolent, um, benign disease that doesn't really cause any problems. 
the big question is, is there a, was, is there a detectable preclinical phase? Again, this is a time before the man has any symptoms that we might be able to detect prostate cancer early. And the, the candidate for that, of course, is the PSA, prostate-specific antigen blood test, which in theory is a very easy test to do, which potentially could help find prostate cancer. Then the following question, if we have that detectable preclinical phase, is treatment for preclinical disease more effective? Um, we, and we do know that there are a lot of complications of prostate cancer treatment, including incontinence and impotence. And for many men, these can be significant issues. And of course, the big question, which I alluded to at the beginning, is the question of does screening reduce cancer mortality? So PSA, which is the prostate specific antigen test, first became available in 1988 and testing really increased dramatically since, that, since it was um, first started to be in use. Observational studies, which is studies looking at men who choose to have a PSA test and men who don't, so they're not randomized into separate groups, had conflicting findings about the benefits of screening. And there have now been three large randomized controlled trials of PSA screening and mortality. So the first one, and again, this is addressing the question, does PSA screening reduce mortality? The first one is the PLCO study, the prostate, lung, colorectal, ovarian cancer study done here in the United States. Over 76,000 men got annual versus no screening, and there was no mortality reduction after seven to 10 years. The European randomized study of screening for prostate cancer, a similar study done in Europe, um, they did find mortality a little bit lower in the treated group. However, in order to prevent one prostate cancer death after 11 years of follow-up, they had to screen 1,410 men and treat 48 additional prostate cancers to prevent one death. And then a more recent study, the CAP study, which looked at the impact of a single PSA screening, no mortality reduction after 10 years. So with the CAP study, and again, we talked about this earlier, but seek and you shall find, the more you do tests and look for things, the more stuff you will find. Um, they found that more were diagnosed with prostate cancer in the intervention group, which shouldn't surprise us. If you're doing more testing, you're gonna find more stuff. But again, finding more cancer didn't and doesn't necessarily lead to better outcomes. So the conclusion is that PSA screening may lead to a modest reduction in mortality. To achieve this reduction, there's a substantial amount of overdiagnosis and overtreatment. So again, the US Preventive Services Task Force, what are their recommendations? They say that we clinicians should inform men age 55 to 69 about the potential benefits and harms of PSA screening. They give this a grade C recommendation. They um, encourage us to individualize the decision to screen. So again, we shouldn't just order the test, but we should make sure that we're having conversations about the pros and cons. And they recommend not screening men age 70 and over. What are some of the pieces of the shared decision-making? So again, all cancers are not the same. And many men, many times we're gonna find a cancer that was never gonna cause a problem anyway. Testing isn't perfect. Abnormal tests may, need, may lead to a prostate biopsy. And treatment may be needed. And again, there are a lot of significant side effects. Um, there are a couple of risk factors. Uh, being African-American and having a family history of prostate cancer is associated with an increased risk. So that can often um, affect a man's decision about whether or not to be screened. And then of course, um, the impact on worry and or peace of mind. So in summary, PSA testing may reduce prostate mortality and shared decision-making is recommended. There are risks to early detection and treatment. And again, we need to have a shared decision-making conversation. So what do we know about prostate cancer prevention? At this point, there's really no proven prostate cancer prevention strategy. Recommendations include choosing a healthy diet, low fat, fruits and vegetables, low in dairy, maintaining ideal body weight and getting regular exercise. But again, no clear cut proven strategy. So let's turn to our final cancer, which is ovarian cancer, screening and prevention. So ovarian cancer, really the question is, should we screen at all? And so the big issue here, as I alluded to earlier, is that thankfully ovarian cancer is a relatively rare cancer. So the lifetime risk of ovarian cancer in a woman with no effective relatives is about 1%. 
A woman who has one affected relative, 5%, um, going up to those who have a hereditary syndrome. There are some breast ovarian syndromes and family um, syndromes where the risk would be significantly higher. But for the average woman, thankfully the risk is low. We also know that if we can find ovarian cancer when it's still in the ovaries, that the survival rate is a lot higher. So what are the potential screening techniques? One of which is pelvic examination, where the doctor um, does a physical examination. The second one is a CA-125 blood test. The third is a transvaginal ultrasound. And fifth is um, com combining the blood test with the ultrasound. So again, the O part of the PLCO trial, they um, had 78,000 women who either got screening or usual care. The screening group got the, the blood test, CA-125 and ultrasound. And then if there was abnormalities, anything positive was followed up by the patient's physicians and they were followed for over 12 years. So importantly, when you look here, if you look at ovarian cancer diagnosis, not surprisingly, there were more diagnosed in the screening group than in the control group because of course they were looking harder. So the relative risk of getting diagnosed was 1.2, so a little bit higher. However, when you look at death, there was actually more deaths in the screen group than in the control group, and there was no significant difference. So it increased the number of diagnoses, which shouldn't surprise us, but, de but did not have any significant impact on mortality. And there were over 3,000 women with false positive screens. And if you have a false positive screen with ovarian cancer, very commonly you have to go to surgery. So this is not just another you know, another imaging study of a, a mammogram or an ultrasound, which is not something we want to have anyway, but this is women needing to go to surgery. And then there were 163 surgical complications. So the conclusion was that annual screening for ovarian cancer with these methods doesn't reduce disease specific mortality and it increased medical procedures and associated harms. So it actually, there was no net positive benefit. So it's not recommended to screen. So what about the screening pelvic examination? This has been a part of healthcare for women for many years. Um, we used to think that women might need it to prescribe um, contraception or for screening for sexually transmitted infection, but what's the goal? And one of the theoretic goals was to feel the ovaries and to see if we could detect ovarian cancer. So there was an evidence report reviewing 52 studies and they found that there was no evidence supporting the use of routine pelvic examination in asymptomatic average risk women, and that it can cause pain, discomfort, fear, anxiety, and embarrassment in many people. Important to remind ourselves though, that this is talking about a screening pelvic examination. So this is a woman who comes in with no symptoms. A woman who comes in with symptoms with lower abdominal pain or other symptoms, the pelvic exam may be appropriate to add some information about this, but in terms of women without symptoms, no evidence of benefit. So what do we know about primary prevention of ovarian cancer? So one thing we do know is that anything that reduces ovulation, as we all know, um, every month during the, the, the woman's reproductive years, she ovulates um, each month. And so anything that we can do to reduce ovulation is going to contribute to reducing the risk of ovarian cancer. So for example, the long, more pregnancies a woman has, the longer she breastfeeds when, when that's feasible, and then also taking oral contraceptives is associated with a significant risk reduction. So in conclusion, the summary of our recommendations, all women age 50 to 74 should undergo screening mammography. All men and women age 45 to 65 should be screened for colorectal cancer. Again, starting at 45 is a relatively new recommendation. Any screening is better than no screening for colon cancer. And again, all roads lead to colonoscopy. So any non-colonoscopy test, if it was abnormal, will ultimately need a colonoscopy. Screening high-risk individuals for lung cancer with low-dose CT does reduce mortality, and it is required that we have a shared decision-making conversation about the pros and cons. Cervical cancer screening options include cytology or routine pap smear, HPV testing, or both. Shared decision making for prostate cancer screening, looking at the pros and cons to help a man decide what is best for him. And finally, screening for ovarian cancer is not recommended.
What else can we do for primary prevention? So quitting smoking not only will reduce lung cancer risk, but as we know, will reduce the risk of many, many other diseases as well. Limiting alcohol intake, there's some evidence that alcohol is associated with an increased risk of breast cancer and, and colorectal cancer, and so reducing alcohol intake can be helpful. Diet and exercise and maintenance of ideal body weight. Chemo prevention for breast cancer prevention, we talked about the medications. Oral contraceptives for ovarian cancer um, prevention, and then consider the roles of aspirin and postmenopausal hormone therapy Again, not taking them primarily to reduce the risk of cancer, but if one is taking them, they potentially can reduce the risk of cancer. And with that, I think we'll stop and uh, take time for questions. Thank you, Judy. That was really perfect. Um, you covered a tremendous amount of very controversial um, information in a very understandable and clear way and left time for questions, which is fantastic. Maybe I'll start with one while, while people are thinking, um, especially for some of the most controversial uh, decisions like uh, mammography, say, in 40-year-old women or prostate screening in uh, 55 to 69-year-old men, um, where it really is a, a toss-up um, based on the guidelines. Um, and you have the conversation with patients and the patients say, gee, I just don't know. What do you think, doc? Uh, what should I do? Um, how do you approach those? And uh, how do you put your nickel down at the end of the day? Because uh, a decision must be made. Yeah, it's it's interesting because I um, that is something that comes up sometime. But I would say more commonly, people have people are often leaning one way or the other, and then um, we have the conversation and they decide. I mean, if the woman has any risk factors for breast cancer, for example, family history or delayed first pregnancy. I kind of walk through with her. If you choose to get screened, this is, you know, this is what could happen. You could have additional testing. You could have all this. Are you comfortable with that? And some women will say, I am, and I really want to know. And other women will say, you know, why don't we just wait? And the other thing I remind myself is if we start the conversation when they turn 40, we're going to have multiple times to discuss it before they turn 50. So it's not a decision that has to be made on their 40th birthday. So oftentimes women will decide, you know, I don't think I want to do it right now, but we'll kind of revisit it in, you know, in a year or a couple of years. And it feels let it doesn't feel like this is the final decision we're only making today. But um, if I'm not going to do it, um, you know, we can talk about it again in the future. Uh, and how about prostate cancer? What should I do, Doc? Um, Prostate cancer is a little more, a little more challenging. Again, you know, I, I walk through with with the man that we're going to be following this these numbers for a long time, and that you ultimately could be having a prostate biopsy. Um, and if he's comfortable with that, I, I kind of like to not just say what are we going to do today, but if it's positive, then this, then this, then this, and are you comfortable with that path? And if they're comfortable with that path, then we do it. Sometimes they've, oftentimes they've already been started on that path and then they come back to see me and, fig, you know, uh, you know, they transfer their care or whatever. And then we kind of have to revisit it again. Um, if they choose not to do it, I'm, you know, I'm very comfortable with them choosing not to do it. Um, cause it's, it's, I think it's a lot less clear in prostate cancer, um, just because, of all the complications of treatment and the fact that so many cancers are benign cancers and so forth. So I'm, I'm very comfortable with, with not doing it. And again, saying we can revisit it again next time if they want to. There's a question in the chat uh, along those lines in terms of um, what are the next steps if the PSA is elevated? Uh, what are some of the uh, prostate cancer diagnostic tests uh, in addition to biopsy? Um, and uh, how do you confirm whether there's prostate cancer? Right. So if, if it's elevated, you know, depending on how elevated it is, first, it often gets followed a little more frequently to see if it's going up or going down. And then if it seems that it's going up, then the usual next step would be some kind of, you know, some kind of prostate biopsy, which is, you know, a transrectal biopsy, which is a, a significant procedure for, you know, for a man to have. but 
depending if it's a little bit elevated than the, the usual, there are kind of guidelines. If it's between X and Y, do this. If it's between Y and Z, do this. If it's a little bit elevated, which is the more common scenario, then quite often we would repeat it in, you know, six months to a year or whatever. And then if it's going up, maybe progress down the biopsy path where if it's staying stable, we can kind of watch it, um, you know, continue to continue to watch it. So it kind of depends on how high it is and if it's going up. If it comes back the initial visit extraordinarily high, then we probably would go straight to biopsy, but more commonly it's slightly elevated and then we would just kind of follow it over time. Uh, one of the questions um, uh, is very specific about some of the statistics uh, you mentioned. Um, uh, you talked about lifetime risk of prostate cancer being 10%, but then also that 30% of uh, uh, men die or uh, found to have it at autopsy. And so the, the, uh, the questioner is trying to uh, uh, measure those two different, those two numbers. So found at autopsy means the autopsy occurred and it was sort of found by accident. It could have been found by accident there. We never knew the man had prostate cancer, but because we were doing the autopsy, we found it. So may, it may not have be, been what we would call clinically significant in that it was there, but it didn't cause any problem. And we never would have known about it if we had not done an autopsy. Whereas, you know, 10% of people developing prostate cancer is more clinically significant prostate cancer. Several of the cancers uh, are predicated a little bit on family history. And the questioner asks, uh, what do you do if you don't have a family history? For example, if you were adopted? So it's a great question. You know, family history, unfortunately, is nothing that any of us can do anything about anyway. And if, if you don't have it, you know, it's unfortunately a missing piece of the puzzle. Um, it, you know, you, you just kind of have to proceed with what you, what you have. And if you don't have it, you can't really do anything about that. I think the other piece to remind ourselves about family history is you know, having a family history, for example, of a father having a heart attack at the age of 80 is very different than a father having a heart attack at the age of 50. And, you know, similarly with cancer, you know, if, if my mother had breast cancer when she was 80, the impact on me would be significantly different than if she had it when she was 40. And so, you know, as we all get older, the incidence increases. And so, um, you know, Many of us are going to have family histories of a lot of things happening at older at older ages, but it's really more significantly at younger ages. And then also, how close is that person to you? Is it a first degree relative? And also, are there multiple family members? But if you don't have a family history, unfortunately, you know, we have to just proceed not knowing that. Um, there's a, sorry, one more, sorry, one more thing I wanted to add. I mean, I think the other piece about family history is that for most for most of the cancers, they are a piece in the decision making, but they're not like it's not as if you if you have a family history, you do X. And if you don't have a family history, you do Y. I mean, it's just another piece of sort of assessing our risk. I would say the one situation in which things might be different would be in colorectal cancer screening, where in general, an average risk 50 year old would have the choice of doing a stool test or a colonoscopy. But if that 50 year old had a father who had colorectal cancer at age 60, we would probably recommend that they go straight to colonoscopy. But in general, the family history kind of modifies your risk a little bit, but doesn't necessarily say, you know, you either do do it or you don't do it. Will we ever have a randomized trial comparing fecal testing and colonoscopy? A uh, great question and probably not. At Well, there is actually there is an ongoing trial. Sorry about that. There is an ongoing trial in Spain right now. They published some preliminary results, not mortality, because we need longer term follow up for mortality. But they did um, publish some preliminary results looking at um, cancer detection and adenoma protection, uh, adenoma detection. So there will actually be at some point, but it'll have to be, we'll have to wait some time because again, what we really want to know is reduction in mortality. Maybe a final question um, is related to um... Uh, the side effect, or maybe not the final question, but anyway, the penultimate question um, is say more about the risk of, of radiation. If, for example, uh, you had a CT scan uh, every year uh, of uh, your head, head, chest, and abdomen, um, how, how quickly would that add up to uh, a cancer and what type of cancer would be most common? So that is a great question. And we have a lot of modeling studies, but not 
not a lot of, you know, absolute studies, but we have become, I would say within the past 10 years or so, much more judicious about when we're doing any kind of radiologic procedure, do we really need to do this? And they, you know, we sort of calculate the number, you know, how much one would get exposed to in normal life versus how much more one gets exposed to by getting additional radiation. And over time, we they calculate these millisevies of um, of exposure and the types of cancer we would probably worry most about would be um, lymphomas and um, sort of abdominal chest type cancers, because um, that's usually where most of the radiation exposure is occurring. Um, there's not an absolute number of you can't have this many CT scans, but I think it just makes us be, you know, just careful about, do I really need this test? Is it really going to change my management? You know, particularly in something where for example, it's being done, you know, following up something is being done annually just because and have things haven't really changed. I think we just kind of want to think judiciously about how often, you know, do we do I really need to do this and how often do I need to do it? There's a nice question about, excuse me, uh, genetic testing for breast cancer. Um, who should get them and uh, how do you uh, act on the results? So great question. This is about genetic testing for breast cancer. So, um, so the for, the way that we first start determining um you know genetic testing is taking a family taking a family history um excuse me one second my computer just got unplugged here um taking a fam family history because if if somebody's at high risk for breast cancer or something we're going to hear about it from their family history so ideally if for example my mother had breast cancer for her to get tested first so we know exactly what mutation to be looking for would be really useful in guiding what I should be tested for. So if we find the affected person in the family that has some kind of genetic, you know, mutation, and then we can know what, what to test the other family members for, as opposed to just testing me for everything when I go in. So that's, that's the usual approach to genetic testing. So typically a primary care doctor, you know, or somebody would hear about the increased risk of breast cancer, um, send send you to a genetic counselor, and then the genetic counselor would get more details about the affected family members and see if they could obtain any testing that any family member might have had to help guide our testing for the for the rest of us. Because we definitely know BRCA1 and BRCA2, but there are emerging other mutations for, for which we're having more information about increased risk. And so just knowing what we're testing for can really guide that decision. And is there an age limit for genetic testing for breast cancer? So I think that's a great question. And I think really the question would be is how is it going to, with any test we do in medicine, how is it going to change my management? So for example, if I'm 70 and I've made it this far without developing breast cancer, it seems that genetic testing would be less useful for me than if I was 40 and my mother had breast cancer in her 40s. And so, you know, again, the question is be, what is it really going to change? And, you know, typically what genetic testing can change, it can either lead to um, decision making about, for example, having a prophylactic mastectomy, having the breasts removed, in some situations, having the ovaries removed, and in other situ and in some situations, taking chemo prevention, and in other situations, um, getting monitored, for example, with mammography and MRI more frequently. So if, if, if we're not going to do those things and it doesn't really, you know, it, it seems un, unusual that we would do a prophylactic mastectomy, for example, in a 70 year old who's made it this far without genetic testing. So I, I think it's not so much the age, but sort of the usual thing we're always, our usual mantra is how is this going to change my management? We'll make this the last question. Could you say a few words about pancreatic cancer? Uh, we don't have any screening tests for that and uh, what is the status of that and is there any uh, opportunities for early detection of pancreatic cancer? So pancreatic cancer, you know, unfortunately, as probably everybody knows, it's a cancer that's typically diagnosed very late because people don't usually get symptoms until it's very far progressed. And in most people um, has a pretty poor prognosis because they're often not able to do curative surgery. So in theory, we'd like to be able to find pancreatic cancer. It's very similar situation to ovarian cancer in that 
thankfully it's a very rare cancer. Um, it's nobody, it's a very serious cancer, but thankfully it is very rare. And so having a screening test for um, a very rare cancer brings us back to the whole issue of false positives and so forth. You know, I think that probably the direction where we might see some um, movement in pancreatic cancer would be amongst people with a really strong family history of pancreatic cancer. Are there screening tests or procedures that we could do in that very select group who's going to be at significantly higher risk? But for the general uh, population, you know, routine screening is just because it's thankfully such a rare cancer. I don't see that we're going to be doing sort of large population based screening. Thank you.